I would like to thank all for your participation and it's a great pleasure for us today uh, to have with you here in our third seminar. Our presenter is uh, Professor Dr. Teresa Franklin. Her speech today is about curriculum design and alignment. Uh, before her presentation, let me introduce her. Dr. Teresa Franklin is a Professor Emerita Educational Studies Instructional Technology in the Pavlin College of Education, Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. She has a passion for teaching and learning through the integration of technology into curriculum and instruction that spans 40 years. Research interests include program evaluation and accreditation, curriculum design, examination of online learning environments, mobile technologies, virtual learning environments, and game development for digital learning. Dr. Teresa Franklin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and welcome everyone uh, this morning on a Friday morning because we've you've had a long week, I'm sure. So here we go. We're going to talk about sustaining quality curriculum and what it takes in order to help you know what you're teaching and how you're teaching it so that you can actually measure that to determine the quality assurance, be part of the quality assurance cycle. So here's a little bit more about me. Um, I've been in education a long time. I worked for the Education Studies Department in Instructional Technology. I've written five textbooks on teaching science for all children because I was originally a science teacher. I taught biology, chemistry, and computer, uh, computer science for 16 years. And so then I moved over into curriculum instruction and in the College of Technology at the University of Houston, I've also worked. And here I am now a specialist at ESTU. Uh, a Fulbright Senior Research Scholar in Sakari University. So I've kind of been around the block on all these different things. Uh, one thing I have done is I actually was an educational consultant for Apple Computer. I was what was called an Apple educator. I helped them determine uh, which products should be rolled out into uh, K-12 schools. So I did that for a number of years as well. So I've kind of had a very varied <laughs> uh, life as an educator. But today I really want to focus on curriculum because I think curriculum is critically important in order to be able to reach your learning outcomes and how you prepare that curriculum to know that you are teaching what students need to know and be able to do. So today we're having these learning uh, objectives. I'm gonna talk about uh, curriculum uh, matrices, mappings and its purpose. And you'll notice that I call these learning objectives and that's because Really today, this is more of a teacher-led sort of thing than it is a student-led uh, activity. So compare and contrast the type of matrices used in curricula development and understand the faculty role in developing curriculum and program review. So we're gonna focus uh, Monday, this past Monday, we focused on learning and understanding student experience. And today we're going to inform program improvement embed the curricular design, review uh, smart learning outcomes. I uh, was here in February and talked to you about smart learning outcomes, but we're gonna touch on them again today just as review to make sure that everyone, uh, if you have any questions about that, today is a good time to ask them on the chat box. Uh, touch on assessment and feedback because on Monday, I'm going to really spend quite a bit of time on assessment and feedback and also talk about how to prevent cheating uh, on testing and essays and assignments and things of that nature. So uh, cheating as we've moved to an online environment has become a more something we think about more than we used to. And so I'm gonna to touch on that on Monday. So again, as you, many of you who've been with me several times know, I like to have def, operational definitions. So PLOs and PLO means program learning outcomes. These are the things your program plans uh, for students to know and be able to do when they graduate from your program. CLOs are course learning outcomes. So that's at the lowest level. Uh, sometimes we call CLOs SLOs, uh, student learning outcomes. So it depends upon your institution. In the United States, we go back and forth between these two course learning outcomes versus student learning outcomes. So they are really about the experiences uh, that a student is going to know and be able to do, the attitudes we expect them to have when they leave our institution and the skill set that uh, we want them to have as well. Typically, student learning outcomes we talk about as the institutional kinds of things, but course learning outcomes and student learning outcomes are used interchangeably. 
Um, here, you call yourself academic staff. In the United States, we call ourselves faculty. So I may use these terms interchange because I'm used to speaking with uh, USA faculty. So those are the people who are responsible for the course or the class at the university. And they sometimes are even called teachers. So it just depends on the terminology that you use here. Teacher in this particular presentation though is going to be a K-12 uh, person, a person who teaches in the K-12 system. College and faculties um, are the same thing in the US. A college is a group of disciplines together such as engineering or business, um, sports, uh, recreation, education. So we call them colleges, you call them faculties, but same thing. And then HED stands for higher education. So when you see that, I'm talking about higher education. And then of course, teaching is the act of instruction by a group of learners in a course, class, field, co-op, uh, internship, and it involves a, a, a wide variety of pedagogies and instruct instructional practices. So these are my kind of list of definitions that I'll be use, uh, using and terminology I'll be using during this presentation. Uh, on Monday, we talked about understanding student learning. And I think this is a critical piece that you need to think about as you look at your syllabus. I referred to it a little bit the other day about what do you find most difficult to teach, but the reality is that when you're looking at student learning, you're really thinking about what do you have on your syllabus? What is on your syllabus that will help them learn, know, understand, be able to do the things that you're teaching within your course? And then how are you going to teach that effectively so that all students learn? And then you're going to measure it so that you can determine that students are indeed learning. And then when they don't learn, what are you going to do? So how are you going to go back after your testing, after your assignment, after your project and regroup so that students who didn't learn exactly what you felt they should do so that they mastered the content will be able to have an opportunity for remediation and to relearn. This takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, but it has a real very rewarding uh, for us as educators when we see that all students do learn the content. So once again, the triangle of success, what should students know and be able to do? What attitudes should they have? You'll notice that there's knowledge, skills, and attitudes as part of their learning cycle. And all of these on the skill size are part of our 21st century skills. On the attitude side, these are the things like self-confidence, integrity, commitment uh, to the field, cooperation. And then of course, the knowledge that is the content, the theories, the information, uh, figures, data that you have within the knowledge of your content. So the first thing I wanna do is define curriculum. And there are lots of different uh, things that we call curriculum. We started with Ralph Tyler in the 50s and you'll see that curriculum is the learning, is all of the learning of students that is planned and directed by the school to attain its educational goals. And you can tell from that definition, we did not have the internet <laughs> because right now uh, you can go out on the internet and get lots of courses, you can learn lots of things. We didn't used to think about students being on clubs and being part of groups on campus. And so really curriculum, this focus of curriculum was more of a K-12 focus in which we were looking at K-12 schools as a way to disperse the democracy, to disperse our uh, attitudes and thoughts about what education was and what our country was uh, that Ralph uh, Tyler actually presented. It has withstood the test of time and we've now acquired it into other uh, organizational methods but curriculum was originally defined in America by this, by this statement. So then you have Hilda uh, Taba who comes along and says it has statements of aims and objectives. And this is where we begin to see thoughts about learning outcomes coming into foreplay. And then we have a group of standards. So here's our first mention of really looking at curriculum from a standards-based perspective in the United States. My favorite is this one that's a little bit different color here. It says by curriculum, I mean the outcomes that educators hope to achieve with their students. And I think that really kind of brings into focus the fact that there's a partnership between faculty, 
um, academic staff and their students. And that this partnership is how we come together and learn the things that need to be learned. So it's the outcomes that educators hope to achieve with their students. Peter, Olivia in uh, 2005 kind of said, well, it's the everything we write down that varies the scope and desired learning experience. And then finally, we have Ainsworth in 2010 that's looking at high quality delivery systems that kind of begins to speak to the fact that we're bringing technology into our learning environments. So you'll see that curriculum has evolved as uh, new methodologies, new technologies have come into play within organizations and within academics. So when I talk about curriculum, I say to people, you know, begin with the end in mind. And this is a philosophy that comes from uh, Stephen Covey. And so you may want to look at this at some point in time. He has a whole series of things that talk about how to organize your life. But this one, begin with the end in mind, whether you're online or face-to-face. -face. And this material that I'm presenting today actually works online or face-to-face. -face. So let's talk about your academic setting here. You have a 14 week uh, semester from what I've been told. You have to subtract really a week at the start of the year as students come in and out. Uh, you don't quite get off to the right start. Your classroom's not working. The technology in your class in the room may not be working. So you kind of lose a little time at the start of the semester. And then you lose a little time for midterm because not only do you get students, remind students to study for the midterm, here's some things to think about, you have the midterm, and then hopefully, if you're looking at a cycle of learning, you are actually going back over some of the things that did showed up on the test as not being uh, well received by the students. Maybe they didn't understand exactly what you were talking about. Maybe there was terminology that needs to be revisited, but you're gonna lose a little time at the midterm. Again, at the end of the year, as you get ready for the finals, you're gonna lose a little time there as well. So. You also have time for presentations and project uh, presentations or working together in teams. All of that takes time out of, of your weeks in a semester. And so really what you have in a 14 week semester is really 10 weeks of three hours per week. So 30 hours to teach the things that students know, should know and be able to do at the end of your course. And so the reality of teaching is learn and learning is that you can't cover everything in the book. And as educators, often we subscribe to a book or we purchase a book and say, this is the book we're gonna use in our class. It has all these uh, handouts and uh, outline of the semester and all that sort of thing. But often, and most of the time, it's what we've seen from the research, most faculty can't cover it as quickly as we might present in the textbook. So you really have to think about what is it that you need to teach? And so I have a little solution for that. These knowledges, knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you need in order to uh, teach in your class. And it's called the 40-40-40 rule of backward design. So starting with the end in mind. The first thing is, is you identify your desired results. What is it exactly you want them to know and be able to do? Determine what your evidence is going to be that they can demonstrate that learning. And then you plan the learning experience and the instruction. So you're starting really with the results. What is it students know and be able to do? What kind of evidence will you accept that they have mastered it? And then you plan the learning experiences. And most of the time we do it the other way. We plan the learning experiences. We say, oh, here's what they're gonna learn from that. And then I'll give a test. And I may give the test that goes with my book, which may not actually be similar to what you have actually taught in class. And so there's a lot of disconnects there, impossible disconnect between what's going on when you're with your teaching and what that test is that you may have received from your, your book or you may have used for years and years. But then if you change your instruction, you also have to change um, your assessment. So I've divided it into what I call the 40-40 rule. The first is what should every student know when leaving your program or course? They should be able to tell you this information. It's worth being familiar with. They should be able to kind of describe it. It fits with the question is the low priority content. So these 40% is low priority content. Or 40, they should be able to tell you this in 40 days. So over 40 days, if you go out on the street and you see your student, you say to them, you ask them a question, they should be able to tell you about that from information they learned in your class. 
The second one is, is what knowledge and skills should they master? So this is things they need to be able to demonstrate when they leave. That is the facts, the concepts, principles, processes, strategies, methods. So if you're teaching a science lab and you have uh, lab techniques that they need to be able to demonstrate, they should be able to maintain that knowledge for 40 months. Okay, so that's almost four years. So in four years, if you met that student again and said, can you do this lab technique? They should be able to do it. And then 40 years, these are what we call enduring understandings. These are big ideas and important understandings that students need to retain throughout the life of their working time. And so these big ideas are the enduring understanding. And these are the ones that they're going to actually change a little bit over time as new technologies arrive. They are big ideas that such as climate change, um, we, we know about the universe, how the universe occurred, those kinds of things. These are what we call enduring understandings. And so when you think about your material that you're developing for your class, you need to think about it in these, this 40-40-40 rule. That is, what are the things they need to kind of know for 40 days? What would be things they need to know four years from now? And then what are big ideas that they need to have some enduring uh, idea about? for the next 40 years. Now, Pluto, when it got decommissioned as a planet, <laughs> kind of messed up our 40 years about, the, about our own solar system. And so these are things that happen along the way because of science. But if you generally think about your content in this way, you'll really cover what needs to be covered. So again, we, I wanna just talk a little bit about learning outcomes. They are specific measurable statements of what graduating and exiting students should know and be able to do or value after completing the program. They are observable behaviors whenever possible, but you should be focused on the results of student learning, not the process and not the teaching, but the actual results of what the student has learned. And they're typically derived from the institution or program's mission statement. So we've talked a lot about having a mission statement and many of you have what we call purpose statements, which are similar to mission statements, but they really come from the mission statement. What is it your student's going to look like when he graduates or she graduates? So if I said to you, describe your student and tell me what they should be able to know the day after graduation, you should be able to tell me different kinds of things that they have learned as part of being in your program. And that mission statement should reflect those kinds of things. Now, the most common method of academic um, learning outcomes used in the United States is something called SMART. And that's kind of to help us remember what we should do when we build our learning outcomes. And the first thing is, is they should be specific. So they're looking at a specific content knowledge or skill set that needs to be learned. And then they need to be measurable. So specific, measurable, then they should be achievable. You don't want to have a learning outcome that students cannot achieve. They should be achievable and be able to be mastered as part of that achievement. They should be relevant. Does, do the learning outcomes match what you actually teach in your course? And are they relevant to the world in which the student is going to go to after they graduate? And so they should match up with the field in which they're going to work. And then they are time-based. So you're setting a learning outcome for the specific time within your course or your program. They should learn this information and be able to demonstrate that knowledge. And in time-based, we look at two possibilities. That is one, they should be transparent. I, a student should be able to read that learning outcome and know exactly what it is that they need to learn. And then they should be transferable to the market place or the, uh, to the industry in which they're going to work. So we have here smart learning outcomes, specific, measurable, achievement, achievable, relevant, and time-based. They typically use Bloom's taxonomy and remember that we have in Bloom's taxonomy three actual parts. We have the cognitive dimension, which is the one most people talk about. And that is because uh, we are often very content directed as faculty. 
but they're about creating is at the top level, evaluating, next, analyzing, applying, understanding, and remembering. So when you ask students to remember something, you are at the lowest level of, cognitive, of the cognitive dimension. At the understanding, you've moved up a level, but you're still on the lower part of learning. So you really want to bring your learning outcomes to the applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating so that in your course, you start out with material that should be remembered and understood. You then apply it. You give the student a chance to analyze what's happened, have them evaluate that outcome. You know, was did the problem, was the problem solved? Maybe uh, there were extenuating circumstances that caused the evaluation to go one way or another or the analysis to go one way or another, and then creating. The same thing is true in the psychomotor domain and also in the effective domain. And remember, we are talking about knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So that effective domain comes into play here as you develop those attitudes within your courses. The things that are valued, how, how do they organize things? Um, under psychomotor, can they copy you, you know, uh, imitation? Can they manipulate materials that need to be? What precision do they have? Can they articulate what they did? So this is part of the 21st century skills of being able to communicate information to one another and understand it. And then of course, naturalization. This is the cognitive process dimension. Again, you can see that there are many verbs and these verbs help us build our learning outcomes. I have one more little example. This is Bloom's taxonomy from the perspective of technology. And so these are verbs that might have to do with technology work that you would have students uh, participate in or do within an educational setting. So there are many kind of variations of Bloom's taxonomy as it's been expanded to bring in active learning technology and different methodologies when in, within your course. So just a reminder, I did look at many, many learning outcomes on, on your website from the different programs you have. I just wanna remind you that really you're talking about the, the verb tells what the action is and what the student needs to be able to master. So in this case, by the end of the semester, that's the time, remember ask for time, the course, EDCT 2030, the student will be able to evaluate the seven steps of digital citizenship as technology is being used in classrooms. So what I've asked them to master is to evaluate the seven steps of digital citizenship. And I've asked them to do it within a classroom context. And so we have here at the end of the semester, the course, who's doing it, what they're going to do, they're going to evaluate, they're, they have to really tell me what the seven steps of digital citizenship is. This is what I want them to master. And then it's going to be used within, they're going to do this within the context of a classroom setting. Because the people I work with, this is where they're going to be when they finish uh, my program. I also use with uh, faculty when we're developing programs or courses, I use something called a backward design worksheet. And this can help you kind of figure out all those knowledge, skills, and attitudes. You start with looking at your concepts and issues that you have within your field that need to be able to be demonstrated. So if you said to industry, what are five skills or two skills that you need to have be able, that a graduate needs to be able to demonstrate, and I teach a course that relates to that, what are they? And then you're going to look at those you're gonna see what those skills will be needed in order to take care of those concepts and issues. You're then going to decide how you would assess the skills. Then you're going to build the learning outcome. Once you've done that, you're going to go back across this graph from right to left, and you're going to look at it again to make sure they all align with one another. At answering the question at the very top, such as what skills must be learners uh, master to demonstrate the intended outcome? What will learners do to demonstrate evidence of the outcome? And sh what should they know and be able to do out there on their job that we as educators are responsible for in here in the university? So why do we develop our design curriculum? 
Well, the reason we do this is so we can look at this student learning that is part of our learning outcome, outcome process because we need to have a cohesive yet comprehensive curriculum. And that curriculum needs to be intentional and focus on student learning. And that's why curriculum and student learning are paired together because they help us build that cohesive and comprehensive curriculum that is intentional. And I think that's one thing that we often don't think about as we build out our courses. We don't think about being intentional. We think the students will get it. We told them to read the chapter. We told them to do this worksheet, you know, assignment, fill out this, um, go online and look at X. And we assume that they will get it by those things. But we need to be very intentional about what it is we are teaching so that it connects to the standards, the instruction connects, the assessments connects, and it focuses on student learning. Because there are really three parts of student learning. The curriculum that we build in our courses and our programs, the instruction that we carry out within the classroom, hopefully active learning models. And this instruction has to be very intentional. And then how we assess that instruction and the student learning that occurs because of that instruction. So there are some challenge uh, to curriculum design. First of all, the breadth and depth of content is overwhelming these days with the speed at which it changes. We have procedural skills and conceptual understandings that have to occur. We have meaningful learning activities. We have to look at the development level of our student. Those of us who have taught the entering level one student often knows that they are not well prepared. Um, and so they have to have opportunities to improve their preparation to get up to speed so that they can be successful throughout college. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end about some of these things that we can do to help uh, the developmental levels of our students. They may not be ready for college. Uh, there are many situations in which we have first year uh, students coming into our universities. Their parents have never been to college. Um, their grandparents haven't been to college. And so what happens is as those come into our classrooms, we, they're not ready. They don't know to take notes. They don't know how to find things on the internet because we assume that everyone knows how to use the internet because you know, we use it all the time. But the reality is, is they don't know how to ch check their sources and make sure that they're uh, viable sources. And they are not ready to read the kinds of content that we ask them to read and at the speed at which we ask them to read. And so there's some college readiness that needs to occur, but there's also then when they graduate, are they career ready? Do they have those soft skills they're going to need to be able to work with people in an environment? such as an office or uh, maybe working within a, an outdoor setting with people. There, there are a whole bunch of skills that go along with, with working besides just what you need in order to do your job. Teamwork, um, the ability to make decisions that are accurate and based on uh, information that you have. You need to teach them to think constructively. And then we also have character development that looks at uh, integrity, uh, ethics, what values do they carry with them out to the field? And then of course, our student generated learning task. So there's a lot of challenges when you look at curriculum and try to think about what are the things that you have to put into your course so that, so that students know and are able to do after they leave from you. So I always say we have the ideal curriculum, the one I would love to have and love to teach. And then I have my reality curriculum the one that has to be taught so that I can prepare students to score on high test, high stakes tests. We have national tests that people have to take for licensure. And so there, there is this part of me that says, you know, if I teach all this, they should know, be, do well on that test. But lots of times they don't know how to take the test. And so part of my reality curriculum is that I have to teach students how to take a test how to discern information, how to eliminate answers when it's multiple choice. Those kinds of things are really part of your curriculum as well. So a change in focus 
from uh, theory, theory is now to job training. I used to spend a lot of time talking about different theories that pave the way for the kind of instruction we do. But now I'm also having to be aware that when they leave my course, they've been out to student teach and I've got to evaluate them and say, yes, you're ready to student teach or no, you're not ready to student teach and you need to come back and take another course. Or I might say to them, I don't know if you're gonna pass the test, the national test that you have to take in order to be a teacher and be licensed. So there's those kinds of things. And then we have this rapidly changing world due to technology so that now, we're teaching online and you're doing Zoom with me. And that's a very new thing for many of us. So, and also we have funding issues. Is there enough money to do the things that we wanna do in our curriculum? Do we have enough money to provide the tools we need? So when you think about curriculum, it also belongs to many people. So it's not just me in my classroom, but you've got your country, you've got your council of higher education, you've got, uh, your NQFs out of the Turkish Higher Education Quality Council. All of these groups are involved in checking curriculum and seeing if things are going the way we should, they should, so that Turkey can meet its goals to have competent citizens. And then the university has a stake in this because they have their mission, their goals, their KPIs. We have faculty and college centers, again, that are involved in this. Programs, you of course, which is mainly what I'm focusing on today, programming courses, but you also have your missions, your discipline standards, your professional uh, standards, goals, along with your courses. So everyone is involved in this curriculum process, even though in reality, you seldom think about it. But what you teach at that classroom level that is part of a program actually filters upward into all of these other areas. So I have a definition here that comes from Hargraves and Shirley in 2009, and they have spent a lot of time looking at what they call rigorous curriculum. And they say that a rigorous curriculum prepares students for the 21st century skills, knowledge, and attitudes that drive economies, innovation, creativity, teamwork, problem solving, flexibility, adaptability, and commitment to continuous learning. And so when I think about my curriculum, and when you think about your curriculum, remember these things. You're trying to do things that will help them, help students become more creative. They'll learn to work as team members, problem solving, flexibility, adaptability, and lifelong learning, because they're probably gonna change their job over time. So curriculum has these components. You have specific program goals, which are standards from the field. And then you have specific courses that have student learning outcomes. Typically, the easiest way, even though it seems hard, I know, the easiest way to build a good curriculum within a program is to, to, to employ a curriculum map. Because a curriculum map tells you about the vertical cohesion, that is, are the courses in sequence? That is, the students are getting the knowledge they need before they take each course. So up here, beginning knowledge, and as you move through, the content becomes more, um, more diverse and also more difficult. And so you have a ver uh, what we call a scope and sequence. That is, you have a vertical cohesion. Then you have a horizontal cohesion. That is, as students move through these courses, are the learning outcomes working with one another so that you meet all your program learning outcomes? You have to identify academic vocabulary. Just like I gave you that list of vocabulary at the beginning of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, you have academic vocabulary that students may not be used to. You also have academic vocabulary that's field specific. Engineers, biologists, chemists, we use different academic vocabulary. And so students need to know that academic vocabulary and it's not, it doesn't come through them through osmosis. It, they have to actually learn that vocabulary. You have to have explicit linkages to your NQFs so that you are meeting the desires of the country. Then you have your 21st century skills that we've talked about before. Communication, problem solving, critical thinking, resiliency is a big one because we've now seen how resilient uh, college students may or may not be after going through the pandemic. We also know that faculty 
have had some resiliency problems as well. And then of course, digital fluency. Curriculum components should be research-based effective teaching strategies. So when you decide how you're going to implement this content in the curriculum, you should think about research-based effective teaching strategies. You need to differentiate, you need to embed your resources and your technology. You need to have communication among all the faculty, academic staff within your program so that you're all talking to one another and know what each other's teaching. And then you have to realize that you're going to have to update your curriculum every two to three years just because of the change in the amount of content we know that appears and from the technological world in which we live. And so you've got new technology, you've got new uh, things we're learning about, about content and about science. So you have to update. And this is what we have difficult doing. I mean, even myself, I think, oh, I've got to look at this. And then two years from now, I'm going to have to think about it again. So doing this work requires that it is ongoing. It's just like quality assurance. It's a cycle. You, up, you design it, you teach it, you check it as you do your assessments, and then you redesign again. So it, curriculum development is itself a quality assurance process. Curriculum components should have high order thinking skills. You wanna move them up, Bloom's taxonomy. You don't want them just to list, identify, define. You want them to move up to those assess, to where they're analyzing, they're evaluating. So you're trying to move them up, Bloom's taxonomy. You wanna connect them with other fields, okay? If I'm teaching biology, where does biology interact with engineering? Where does biology interact with business? Where does it biology interact with maybe literature? Because there's some very interesting things that we read about even in literature that have to do with biology. And so you wanna kind of look at these interdisciplinary connections so that you can reach your students in all the different ways they can learn. And not every student just learns by reading. Not every student learns just by writing. Not every student learns by lecture. So you have to figure out different ways that you can use interdisciplinary connections to touch all the senses and learning capabilities of your student. You want them to do tasks that are authentic. That is, they will apply in the real world, not just something to do so that you can grade it and say, yeah, they mastered that. But these need to be authentic real world uh, skills and concepts. And then you wanna have ongoing assessments. And we talked about those uh, cats the other day and how you can use those as ongoing assessment in your classroom to see if you can check for understanding. Typically designing and mapping is a multiple year process because you're gonna keep redoing it over and over. You plan carefully, understand why you're implementing these new practices when you decide on new practices, and then understand how these practices will fit with things that you're already doing. Don't just throw out everything and start over. You wanna fit new practices into what you're already doing. It's a method to align instruction. It documents what's taught. It tells us where gaps are and helps design an assessment plan. And that's why we curriculum map. Those three things are critically important. It also improves communication about curriculum among faculty, improves program coherence, and increases the likelihood that student achievement of the program level outcomes will occur. And for one thing, it encourages reflective practice. And we are all very, very busy as faculty and academic staff, but we need to stop ever so often and think about what it is we're actually doing and why we're doing it, not just to get through so that we can go do our research, but how does our research connect back to that classroom and how is our research embedded within the classroom so that students learn? Curriculum map gives us uh, standards driven uh, learning outcomes, instructional strategies, learning experiences, and an aligned set of assessments that actually help you gauge your students progression during and after the instruction. So where do you begin? Well, first of all, you need to get all your uh, faculty together, all of your uh, academic staff. You need to get together in a room and you need to talk about what it is you actually do in each of the courses. 
And is there overlap? You need, this you need students maybe that have taken the courses, alumni uh, that are from the field. You need business people if you've got industry, if yours aligns to industry. All of these groups should come together and look at this curriculum as you develop it. Usually it starts with your academic staff, but then others should have an opportunity to weigh in so that they can say to you, well, when your students come to my, uh, my work, to my business, I'm not seeing that they know X. Where do you teach it in that uh, curriculum? And that way you have a chance to have an ongoing discussion with your alumni. And then students might, you might use students and say to them, okay, what was the most difficult part of this curriculum? Which course was the most difficult and why? And that gives you an opportunity to look at all avenues of your curriculum. It has to be that all faculty develops the program. It cannot just be one. Because what happens when one person develops the program is that one person puts it all down on a sheet of paper and the rest of you have to fit in. Or you do your own thing and you don't have a cohesive program. So one of the things you wanna look at is your national standards, your standards of good and best practice in the field, skills that have to be known, competencies that you expect and the industry will expect, essential questions or trends. You need to be teaching what's happening out in the future of this industry as well. Resources that are needed, big ideas um, that are in the field, but not yet explained maybe. And then experiential learning opportunities. There should be some opportunity for internships, clinics, or some kind of shadowing of people within the industry during the time when it's of the four years that an undergraduate is in the institution. Don't forget to collect data. Data should also drive how you decide how your program will become. You should have student feedback on course evaluation, staff discussions with part-time academic staff. So if you have what we call non-contingent faculty, faculty are not in tenure lines, they just come and teach a course and leave, you need to talk to them. What are they seeing? Because for one thing, they don't see the students all the time. And so they can tell you some things about the students that you may not know. Staff discussions on program meetings, alumni working in the field, alumni that left the field. They didn't just stay in the field. They decided, you know, don't like this field. Here's why. Businesses that hire your graduates. And then of course you have government regulations and Ministry of Labor and Social Security information. So what's happening in the labor department? Again, you're gonna use all your different NQFs. You're gonna look at your university mission, vision and goals because you have learning outcomes for the students on campus that are part of the university's uh, goal to reach competent citizens, determine program mission, program learning outcome, and then the strategies of how you're going to reach there. And you're really, it's all about what are students supposed to know, be able to do, and the attitudes that they should have when they graduate. You're gonna build documents to actually show this so that you as make sure everyone is on the same page. So you have your program of study that shows the order in which courses should be taken, your program learning outcomes to your courses, PLO and course year leveling. This is what we call the vertical cohesion. Assessment matrix, what assessments and which courses. Instructional matrix, what types of instruction occurring and where is experiential learning occurring and who's responsible for it and how do you assess it? So these are what we call the documents that surround a curriculum. I'm gonna share a few of these with you. You've seen some of them before, but this is what we call uh, the uh, planning tool that we use. So this is a course on human relations and communications. So first of all, here's the course, here's week one. Here's the topics I'm going to cover in week one. Here are the university and program learning outcomes that week one is going to attend to. Here are my course learning outcomes. And I've also noted which program learning outcomes these two align to. And you'll notice they are using Bloom's taxonomy. In each one of these, under the university and program learning outcomes, you're assessing and evaluating. In the course learning outcomes, you're distinguishing, you're describing internal and external political forces. Then here's the assignment with the assessment. 
And you'll notice that in this particular case, this is we're talking about open and closed systems in uh, politics that impact universities and K-12 schools. We're gonna use a rubric and actually go out and check an institution to ask them questions that would help us determine if they're an open system or are they more closed system within uh, the, what we call the academy. And then we're gonna do an environmental scan memo and we're gonna use a rubric to cover that. This is, um, helps us look as we talk to one another and are planning the program every year and reviewing what we did, getting ready for accreditation because we're an accredited program. And so we use this to help us see what everyone's doing. What this does, as we look at all of our courses, is we realize that sometimes we're all teaching the same thing and we're just teaching it the same thing all the time. And, one, and that was actually a, quite, uh, some, a statement that occurred from one of our students. They said, well, I took this and you talked about it here. And then to, the next year I took it and you talked about it here. And our question was, were we reinforcing it? And they said, no, it was the same exact content. So you have to kind of think about your progression across the four years that a student is there in your program and how your content progresses as well. You shouldn't just be teaching the same thing again. You will reinforce that content by bumping it up a little bit and talking about the next level, calling on that previous knowledge that they got in the course before. So it's about thinking about what did they learn in course number one? How can I reinforce it in course number two by using their prior knowledge of course one? And then as they move through all the courses, you should be doing the same thing until you assess it. Now this one uh, is a map of program learning outcomes with courses. Uh, what it does, it shows the outcome alignment from introductory to mastery. And I saw that uh, we saw quite a bit of this sort of thing. We, not the same terminology, but low content, medium content, high content sort of discussions on your website. But this actually tells me where a concept is introduced and also where it's assessed. And so this helps you know if it gets reinforced and then is it also being assessed? And there are some issues here in this one. For example, we are looking here, museum collecting, they're introducing and assessing uh, the knowledge of key historical material, theoretical perspectives, institutional practices and legal and ethical concerns. And then it's being reinforced Again, and then in the internship, it's actually mastery. So you'd have to think about, should it also be assessed uh, maybe in the internship again, or should it be not assessed in the museum collecting? So you have to think about these things as you look across this to see where things are reinforced, where they're introduced and where they're mastered and reinforced. The next one is a map of pr program learning outcomes showing courses outcomes and alignment to assignments. So across this, I can look at the courses at the top, the program learning outcomes down the side, and I can see that in for disciplinary knowledge base models and theories, it's mostly exam questions. That seems appropriate. You're trying to make sure they actually understand and remember the knowledge base. Okay, so you're at the lowest level of the content that you're gonna teach in this particular uh, program. And then you'll notice as they go through, they move to annotated bibliographies. They've got class assignments and exams. They have presentations. They have lab papers, term papers. So they've got a wide variety in which they have, they have used different assessments to make sure that the student is learning the material. And you'll notice that, oops, You'll notice at the end, they have a capstone, which is a portfolio in which they must demonstrate each one of these learning outcomes. So they have to show a paper. They might show a project that they did and pictures of them being on the project working. Uh, they may uh, show them working as a team, but it, this portfolio at the end of their uh, program is going to actually capture and document that they have learned this content. We have found in the US that portfolios are really a great way for students to demonstrate what they know and are able to do. They are difficult to grade, I will tell you. They take a long time to grade, I can tell you that too. But we've, I find that when I look at them, 
I actually can see what the student knows and is able to do. So I have, I have to say that I really like portfolios because they demonstrate exactly what the student has done. And when you read their self-reflection on each part of their student learning outcomes, you have an opportunity to say to yourself as the faculty member, wow, they got that look, they even exceeded what I thought they were going to learn on that topic. And then you'll have other places where you'll go, wow, he really missed the boat on this or she really missed the boat on that. And so portfolios are a great way to really look at uh, learning outcomes for your program. There are lots of pieces of software that students can use. We actually have them. We have some uh, programs where they build uh, within a piece of software. We have other programs where they use a free software that's online. We have some that we have purchased software. We have some where they build web pages and those web pages tell us and show us what they know and are able to do. And they have to write a reflection I met this learning outcome by doing X and here is what I learned. And so they have to do a reflection piece. It's stressful for them. It makes them have to go back and think about their four years or two years. We do this in our master programs as well. But I really see a lot of deepening of the learning because over the four years, they're going back and revisiting from time to time. So what about assessment? Well, assessment really is about improving. So it's feedback to determine how the academic program can be improved. It informs faculty members of what is, and staffs and decision makers about the growth of students. It demonstrates and creates evidence to students, faculty, staff, and the outside community that you're doing what you say you're doing. And it really supports campus decision-making and program review or accreditation as you look at continuous improvement. So assessment has these four characteristics. So of course, you're going to identify the student learning outcomes. You're gonna reflect on what it would look like for a student to achieve those outcomes, identify where in the program the outcome is delivered, and then consider where the institutional method used to deliver the outcome may suggest an assessment method that matches it. So you're trying to think about delivery of the outcome, what does that look like? And do I have an assessment method that matches up? So always think about how can student learning improve? And there are really three questions that drive that. What are you trying to do? What do they need to know and be able to do? And how well are you doing it as an institution, as a program, as a course? Methods of assessment influence learning outcomes. Learning outcomes influence instructional activities. Instructional activities influence methods of assessment. You'll notice that these are double-ended arrows. That means this influence goes back and forth and you're constantly rebalancing these three items. The method of assessment, the learning outcomes, instructional activities. So all of these three things work together in tandem to help create an effective learning environment. Again, the, an assessment matrix, we talked about this one before, but just to remind you, this can also be used to check your assessments to see if you're assessing in the proper places. And this becomes your evidence of student learning. These things they did in class are your evidence of student learning and these should be kept, you should have some uh, repository for where you're keeping this kind of data to help you know if you're teaching the things that need to be taught and are students learning the things they need to learn in order to be successful. So final word about curriculum and practice. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier. We have spent a lot of years doing research on high, what we call high educational practices, high impact educational practices. Over the years, we have two organizations, LEAP, which is the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And then we have what's called NESI, which is the National Survey of Student Engagement. How engaged are students in courses? 
and how engaged are they in programs and how engaged are they in their university. And across the United States, all of our institutions provide data to these two organizations on this process. These are high impact educational practices that you might want to think about for your institutions because they are part of a curriculum. The, one, the first one is first year seminars and experiences. And I think you already have something similar to this where you are bringing together your first year students and talking about the university, how do you negotiate the university, what's it like to live together here. We have what we call common intellectual experiences. So we have the common courses as you do. We have learning communities where students in certain majors live together in dorms and they take their courses together. So when they go through the university, they are always together. And that gives them an opportunity to find people who can help them find people that they can learn from because we know students learn great from others. And so there are a lot of people, a lot of students that can help them learn. And so that when they're together, they find out about different students' abilities and how they can help each other. We have writing intensive courses because we know students do not want to write, but they need to write. Writing is an essential part of who we are as human beings. We write to express ourselves. And so we have writing intensive courses. They learn how to do technical writing for the sciences. They learn how to do um, writing for uh, journal publications. They learn how to do writing for just essays of enjoyment. We have collaborative assignments and projects. We, and we have instituted undergraduate research. So in our programs, in some course within every program, there is some undergraduate research that occurs with typically with that faculty member in their particular area of research. We have diversity and global learning. We have e-folios, as I was talking about, we like portfolios. Service learning to the community where a group of maybe uh, students from business go out and work with a business in the community. We have internships and we have culminating senior experiences. So we have lots of areas where students work with one another, they work with faculty members to actually improve their learning. And these are really the set of research-based information that helps to improve the practice on our campuses. And so these are things that you might wanna look into some more and think about as you're working through your programs and building your curriculum. One thing I want to remind you is that this, this is a process. It never ends. It's like quality assurance and every other cycle, it, it goes on and on and you keep improving. It's about continuous improvement. Time is required to do this. And that is something that faculty have very little amount of. And so administration needs to be aware that time is needed if faculty are going to have strong curriculums and strong curriculums within a program give us reputations as great institutions. It works best, best if a team is diverse. So you may even bring faculty from another area of campus to kind of talk to you as you're uh, building your program to get their opinions, to get them to think about these things. That helps us think about that interdisciplinary uh, work that we can do. One person is often does this work, but it really doesn't help the university when it's not done as a team. Programs and courses will change over time. So you have to remember that you will be doing this again and again and again every two to three years. But the teamwork piece is essential because curriculum plus staff plus students really improves learning on a campus. So do I have, I think I'm at my time, right at my time, but if we have questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, if you'll type them in the chat box, I'll be happy to do that. And one other thing I'd like for you to do while you're listening and finishing up is I want you to do to talk uh, to send me a little note that tells me one thing you learned today. What was one thing that you thought about and went, oh, I might do that or something that you hadn't heard of before. And I want you to type it in the message box in the chat box. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Teresa, for your contribution. We are waiting oh, just, for the response. 
Okay, just one more thing. Some people may, may maybe they don't know where the chat is, but it should be, you should be able to see it uh, on your window. So if you don't know where the chat box is, uh, you should be able to find it on your window. On my window, it's at the top, but since I'm a host, I'm not sure where it is on yours. <laughs> I think they know the okay, chat box. Good. Great. Yeah. And I just uh, give my response on the chat box, you know, I what I told. And one participant uh, here just raised her hand. Okay. Um, I'm okay. Yeah, please, Dr. Saye. Hello again. Hello. Uh, Dr. Teresa, thank you very much for your presentation. It was again, very comprehensive and inclusive. And I have a, a question, but that might be very specific. So I'm sorry for if it is too specific, but I was just wondering, you told that, you told that yes, this is right. We have to, you know, evaluate our curriculum and make revisions uh, every two or three years. Uh, but what if, uh, we make a very major revision in our PLOs, CLOs, and there are already students in the education that are third grade or about to graduate. And uh, how can we assure that these major rev revisions may also be gained by the students before they graduate? Because these revision revisions may include the courses that were previously given or taken by the students. Uh, should there be specific efforts uh, to assure that these uh, students about to graduate can also get uh, these new skills or you know, knowledge or other things? Uh, yes, you, if you change your curriculum significantly, okay, um, that is you bring in new content that maybe should have been taught in level two or year two, but the people who are now going to graduate need to get that information as well, then you're going to have to think about how you can get that information to them. What you might do is do a seminar uh, to help them, a, a seminar that is maybe outside the courses, but actually attends to that learning outcome. You might also uh, talk with people who are teaching at level three and four, your other faculty and staff members, and ask them, is there a place where we can take that content that needs to be learned and link it to what you're doing as well, so that they see the two in tandem it's not just something that's thrown into the class, but that actually has a reason for being there. And you may have to have a time, you know, where you're going to bring that into the course. But if you make a significant change where you're actually changing content significantly from year two, that also needs to be known at year four, you're going to have to figure out a way to do that. And typically we do it as independent seminars um, where students will come in for an hour, maybe for a lab a session or a two hour lab session where they meet and do these activities because we've changed the way we're actually straining for DNA or something like that. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to figure out, yes, how you're going to weave those in. And often we just say to students, we have changed, we're cha in the process of working on the curriculum. We're updating the curriculum. This is something we found that we believe industry is going to expect that you know, and we're offering this seminar at this time for you to have the opportunity to interact with this new content. Now, in the US, when students um, hear that industry wants that skill or that content, they show up. I don't know how it is here, um, but that is because they want to be sure that they can compete for a job. The competition is very stiff in the U.S. for jobs, and so they want to be able to have that content information. And I hope that answered you your, the question. <laughs> yeah, th thank you very much. I think this is the point we are always missing because, of course, there are some improvements in the curriculum, but uh, there are also students about to graduate and they are just graduating away and they don't get the new skills or the information. That's what we really ignore, I guess. And if it's okay, I, I would like to ask another question. Sure. 
Okay, yeah, again, and thanks. It was a very comprehensive presentation and inclusive as well, but I, I'm still wondering if there are any um, specific or critical issues uh, to take into account when it comes to curriculum design for especially graduate programs. For graduate programs, you need to be very sure that they are really organized around research. Um, in our particular, because that, unless they are a skill-based, I guess I have to clarify that a little bit. In my particular field, our graduates that are in the master's level are actually what we call master's teachers and they're going into K-12. As master teachers are, they're going to be administrators in K-12. And then I have another group that are what we call the researchers and these, this research track and they're going to be researchers. And so you have to be sure that what you're doing at the graduate level, the curriculum is one, flexible enough if they are research to researching to allow for them to have their own research and not just do your research. But at the same time, your research should actually inform them of what's going on in the field and areas in which they might become researchers. So that's kind of the research track. And there should be lots of seminars. We have lots of guest speakers that come in and talk to our graduates about what's going on in this particular type of research. Here's the most methods that are commonly used and that sort of thing. So we have a lot of guest speakers who come in and actually share what they're doing out in the real world. And sometimes they take on some of our graduate students as um, interns and therefore they get that connection or networking. So part of our graduate program is not just the content, but also the networking to help them get into these, these different fields. Now for those people in the other track that are actually going into administration work in our K-12 schools, we have them shadow, do shadowing of in the field. And so they spend a semester where every morning or every afternoon, depending on which one, they spend three or four hours out in that setting. They write, uh, they take pictures, they, they gather information, they do surveys, they, you know, re they do what we call active research that is in, in a setting situation. And so they're doing more hands-on practical research that will inform decisions right away. So we've, we kind of, we really step up the game in order to make sure that at the graduate level, the masters and the PhD level, these people are really embedded with people in the field of what they're going to study, you know, what they're studying and all to give them that opportunity to do all that networking because it's even a smaller pyramid in the United States to get a faculty position. And so we want to be sure we've networked those students. We make them go to conferences. They have to present at conferences. Um, we work on papers, writing journal papers together for the research track. So we really have um, a number of things that have to do with this is what your life is going to be at, like as a PhD student. So figure, you know, figure it out because this is how you're going to be, your life is going to be like. And at the administrative group, it's the same thing because administration in our K-12 schools is a very difficult job in the US. So we're really trying to get them to have more job experience on the job experience. Thank you very much, Dr. Teresa. Um, let's see, can you suggest a specific met method for developing the design education curriculum as a field has unique demands? Um, Design education. Oh, <laughs> so you want to actually, you want, I think, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Uh, this is Nure Aslan. Aslan. Um, can you developing the design education? So you're talking about, does, are you talking about instructional design or just research design? Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Franklin. Uh, I'm uh, an architect and uh, I'm teaching at the university. Uh, uh, as a architectural design education. Uh, this is my specific question is uh, about uh, design, uh, architectural design, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I were thinking about architectural design, which I know almost nothing about, um, other than where you're located on this campus, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would probably say that you need to use what's called the research design cycle. Um, we have a, if you will email me, I will send you a set of slides that 
Um, I have presented elsewhere that talks about this design process where you go out and you work with clients and, or you uh, go out, for example, we were the group that I worked with, they were going to change the theater. We have a movie theater in, our, in the town in Columbus, Ohio. They were gonna change that movie theater. They're gonna redesign it. So we took a group of students to Columbus they met with people, all the people that were available to talk about the theater and the kinds of work that was done at the theater, and what things happened at the theater, and what the time schedules were, jobs, the interior, sound effects, lighting, all those things that go into working in a theater. And they interviewed them. Then they went out on the street and just people that passed by the theater, they would stop and ask them if they ever been to the theater, why would they go to the theater? So they gathered all this qualitative information about the theater. They took it back and analyzed it and then wrote a proposal for how this theater might change or what needed to be done to improve the acoustics. They met with architectures that were going, architects that were going to do the redesign. And they proposed, here's what we think some possible solutions might be. With this team from the theater and from the um, university, they decided on a couple of those problems, they're out solutions as targets. Then they went back in and really redid the research again, just focusing on those particular targets. Again, they came back as the team, worked through the process of, you know, here's the best solution now out of all these things. And then the architect took those, that information into how he drew the plans and the, and the cost and all that sort of thing. I mean, they looked at everything, budgeting, um, you know, the whole hierarchy of the theater process of putting on a play or a musical or whatever. And so they really went through that design, what we call the design uh, cycle. And I, if you will email me at my email address, which let me see if it, I think it's on the next slide. Let me just check. Yeah, there's my email address. If you will email me, I will actually send you uh, some information. There's a great site out on the internet called IDEO, I-D-E-A-O. And that group works in the kinds of things that architects work in and how to um, put together teams in order to solve architectural problems and design problems around architecture. Thank and they're you. a great group. I hope that'll help you, but if you'll email me, I'll send you that information. Sure, I will email you. Thank you very much for the information. Oh, any question? Um, let me see. I've got I, one ha more. I have one, one more question. <laughs> Please. Uh, my question is how should we update and revise the syllabus, and which and, method would you recommend? And how often, actually? Um, I, actually, I actually think the syllabus has to be looked at every single time you teach the course. I don't think you can just take a syllabus and put it out there and use it again semester after semester after semester. I think you have to see what is going on in the world so you can pull in those real world activities, those things that are going on. I mean, there are some things that are enduring. Remember I told you there's those 40, 40, 40, where at the last 40, those are things that last 40 years. There are some enduring concepts, but in reality, life moves on and the world moves on. And so you need to be looking at what's going on in the world to see how it can connect to your class that semester. And for that reason, I think you need to relook at your learning outcomes. Did you teach what you thought you were gonna teach? Did the students learn what you thought they were going to learn in your course? How did that connect to the real world? And then, you know, if those things didn't happen, how can you redefine those and rewrite those learning outcomes and assess them so that you can be sure that you are teaching what you hope the students will learn and that they will know the, and do those things and be able to demonstrate them and that in the end they will actually fit with the next course that they're probably going to take and then work in the real world. I think lots of times we don't look at our syllabi to um, teach what is also connecting also to the, what's going on in the real world 
uh, now. For example, you're in architecture. I have a thought, saw a really interesting thing yesterday in uh, online about the fact that in Arizona, which is hot and dry, that they're having a huge crisis because they do not have enough electricity all the time. They have, they have some blackouts and things because their homes are using so much electricity to cool their homes. And this architect was, is in the process of now redesigning homes in Arizona so that they're what they call a passive house and they won't need as much uh, electricity. That's really important to those people in that area. And that's going to eventually with climate change be really important to all of us, this passive home design. And so I think you need to connect you know, with what's going on in the world and where is it happening around the world because I, we get tunnel vision. And I find myself doing the same thing. We get tunnel vision on just what we're teaching and there's this whole other space out here where all <laughs> kinds of stuff's going on that we need to know about and tell our students about and help them learn about. Remember, we want them to be lifelong learners. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think no more question. I didn't Thank you it. for all your comments and the things that you thought you, you feel like you learned or had discovered in this process. I, I love the little comments. They're wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all your participation. And we would like to see you in our uh, last uh, seminar.